Ultimately, when you are a strong performer, first of all, I actually think of myself, I think when I think about what I was pursuing in my career, even though I was able to achieve a great deal in performance, I actually think I, I was always thinking of myself first and foremost as a teacher. I feel like that's where, you know, I was performing on top of what I was doing with teaching, but that performing was always, always there. Um, but one of the greatest ways that you can learn about your skills as a performer or as an athlete is, is through teaching, right? That's the highest level of education. So when you think about like, oh, I need to switch to be that teacher. If you come at it from a place of like, just looking at your own skills and your own abilities from a point of objectivity. And we'll do this with our students in classes and we do this in you know different industries. We'll say like switch and turn on your teacher mind. What would you think from an objective standpoint? And it allows you to kind of stand back. Welcome to the Chet Black Live podcast, where I bring forward business leaders who have accomplished great things in their business, and we take you behind the curtain of their operation so that you can glean the knowledge and the experience they have as a shortcut, but also um, maybe sometimes some mistakes come up that, that they've experienced that you don't have to make. Now, I've done something uh, different and Carmen and I were just talking about this and I'm bringing someone from outside the real estate industry, but she's been inside it for a few years and we'll get down to that. Um, Carmen is just so accomplished worldwide in the music industry, uh, but what you're going to capture is the parallels of operating a real estate team, a brokerage, or being a salesperson or any industry from what she's going to share. So my longtime great friend, Carmen, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, John. Always happy for any time I can spend with you. So let's just jump in. Let's do a quick little backstory. Tell everyone a little bit about you and uh, what your focus was at a young age and then mm -hmm. bring us forward to the business that's in place. And then and I'm teed up ready to go down the places and the paths that I need to go to um, pull out of you what can be really helpful for people. So take us back and, and forward if you would. Sounds great. Okay, so my background is as a classical concert pianist. So my father is a teacher, continues to be a prominent teacher. And so we were raised in a household of basically as soon as we could sit upright, it's time to start honing our skills and reaching our full potential. And that really is, it's really a pillar of how we were raised. So classical piano training was really at the core of everything that we were learning. But it always came through a lens of, you know, that character development, about doing our best work, about managing our time, managing our focus. There was a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship growing up. So with this type of training and with this type of upbringing, my brothers and I really kind of modeled the results of that. So I first performed with orchestra as a soloist at the age of 10, right, through a series of competitions. And I always say, like, that's, that's great that that's when I kind of was able to get out of the gates at a professional level. But ultimately, it's not even the youngest. My brother, one of my brothers did that as young as seven, right, and the other at 11. So when I, as much as I like, like everyone to believe that I was just born with this unique talent, it was really about the training that we were in, I believe, truly. So I'm very thankful to my dad um, for that and to to our family. So I grew up in the performance based world. So competing, performing, uh, but at the root of it all, I always wanted to be a teacher. I was at I was interviewed before I was going to a national competition. I think when I was nine years nine years old, and they asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. And it's always been a teacher. Just this concept of guiding people, mentoring people. I was always inspired by my dad and the way that he could kind of draw draw the most out of people and see possibilities in people. I see that a lot in you, John. I always highlight that you, you've got this ability of kind of saying you can do more, you can, there's more there, you know? Um, so I, I always think that that's a, a big, um, big element of being a strong teacher. So I took that and after my post-secondary, I pursued teaching. So formal teaching, I taught at the university here in my city. And then always knowing that I had the entrepreneurial drive as well. Part of that reaching for your full potential, I launched my commercial school in 2013, um, grew that, learned so much through the process of entrepreneurship, so many parallels between learning what it takes to prepare and get up on stage in high pressure situations compared to the entrepreneurial 
um, experience of opening your own business, building it up from the ground up. And that all the learning that's included in that grew that to be, you know, a profitable, healthy, seven figure traditional business. And then um, a wise mentor, John Sheplak, came into my life and said, hey, have you ever thought about this online space? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about, John. It took me a while to kind of bring it on and really adopt it and then launch that and grew that to a seven figure entity as well. Um, but I think what came through that is, again, always looking for the connections, what's more, what then what not what the next shiny object is, but it's always like, what's the next iteration of what I can do and what I can challenge myself for. So that led me down the um, path of consulting, specifically in instructional design. So obviously my background is in education, specifically performance-based education. Uh, a lot of my early kind of training around that is in pedagogy. So um, guiding, that's when you have a dependent learner or a, or a child who's a learner. And then there's a whole other field that mirrors that, which is andragogy which is working with adults. And really this window that opened up to me when I moved into the online education space, actually, because all of our students there are adults, is that this ongoing drive and these ongoing growth cycles that we see in early childhood and throughout our students' upbringing, we can tend to think that that's like this irreplaceable window that we have to kind of harness, you know, before they're 18 and that sets the path for the rest of their lives. But the reality is, is that the lifelong learning, it's it's going until the day we, until the day we fall over, right? So being able to kind of move from a space where all my focus was working with students, you know, as young as two years old, we get them started very young in a very focused way, knowing the value of that window and then being able to see the value of adult education on the other side. So that's what's led me into, you know, consulting, working with people in the real estate industry has been such a joy because there's so many parallels between performance-based getting up on stage and performance-based getting up and doing the actions that are needed to succeed in this industry. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Oh, and and that I'm and that I'm currently uh, focusing on a, a psychology degree, because that's kind of all tied together. <laughs> so, and all your free time, right? And yeah, you know what? I just it, it's it's like all the things that you say that I know uh, we align on is that just do a little bit every day. Next thing you know, five years has gone by and you've accomplished more than you could have imagined at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So just chip mm -hmm. away at that stone. Mm -hmm. Really good. Let's go first in in what you've um, observed and learned in the music space, and then certainly we'll get into because you've spent a, a lot of time in 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 taking action. And when we take action in our own business, as the business evolved, the learning that's taking place in business and now leading other people. But let's let's go down to the teaching space and your observations. Mm -hmm. Over time, have have you been able to identify pretty quickly? And if so, how quickly, if someone is going to commit or not, and if someone's going to be productive or not, that is the, you know, there's all the personality tests and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, share with us your observations and your core belief in that space. Absolutely. And I can say like working with young, young children and young students. So take coming from that space when they're such dependent learners, right? Mm -hmm. um, we ultimately, there will be, be different gifts that you see you, when you interview them, you see that they have different aptitudes uh, and different you know, dexterity coordination. Everyone's working with their unique gifts, but ultimately what is the determining factor is always the parents, right? In that, in that scenario. So when you hear that, you you can tie it into what happens in business and in other spaces, which is essentially what the parents are, is that the that's the environment, right? The environment is what determines the growth, the beliefs that they're surrounded with, because ultimately you can have the most valuable lessons, you can give them the most impactful tools, but if they aren't in an environment that is going to challenge them to grow and to build in that structure and support that they need to actually implement it and put it into place, it's all going to be at a loss, right? And so when you move that over into other fields, um, you see it in the way that people build out their cultures and their business dynamics in the way that they structure their training programs. You take so much into it just based on the beliefs that you carry forward and the expectations that you set um, and what you believe is possible, really. Really good. So as you evolve, I mean, obviously there's, I'm going to guess that there's people that when you first started that you you've met and became friends and they just went off and ventured into something else, whether they, they lost interest. What, what's that look like? I mean, how long does, does a parent have to ride along with a child? And then, and then when should they, is there a should be 
um, should they allow um, that choice point? I mean, not that, hey, you're putting someone in a box, but mm -hmm. I don't know, Tiger Woods' dad, I think, kind of put him in a box. And mm -hmm. I think that's a, a lot of what you see if you go back in history of people with that experience excellence. Um, when is that time frame? Have you seen people that, that were just amazing and excellent, as good as, or maybe even you looked at them and thought, man, they were better than me. And then they just fall off. What, what, what happens there? Absolutely. I think it's a fine line and it's a great question, actually, like a, that obviously comes from the point of a teacher and a coach to be asking those things, because there is, first of all, if you think about a, a child, and so that's just, it's just kind of a very pure way to look at the learning process, right? Because when you're working with adults, you're working with all different levels of experience. And frankly, that level of life experience is equally important to the level of knowledge that you have as a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to align with that. But by looking at the learning process of children, you kind of have that clearer slate in some ways where you can kind of see the processes. Um, it is important, like we always say, the same way that you would help a child to read, you do right. have to have that structure and support and environment built in, especially in the early stages, because you can't expect them to understand that whole feedback loop of the benefits that they're going to get after the fact. So you really do have to drive the bus in guiding the process, in looking with objectivity when they don't want to practice, when they don't want to do these things. It's only because they haven't experienced those feedback loops of, okay, I know how to push through and get to the other side. But then it is so important that you build in the ways that you step back. Ultimately, people have to be driven by their own needs and their own desires. And your goal is always to kind of embed that and implant that and instill and inspire that as much as you can in the way that you teach. But ultimately, you're always working with their own intrinsic drives and the, own, the things that motivate them, which are going to be different for different people at different times in, in life, right? So that ability to step back and not make it about yourself is such is such the key point that I think determines whether people sustain or not, because ultimately you have to give ownership of the skill and whatever it is that they're building to that person, right? And your your role is as the guide to walk alongside them, to you know highlight blind spots, to you know poke them and nudge them when they need it, and step back when it's time to step back. All those things. And what I find is when teachers or mentors can be kind of over they don't know when to step back, then the the student always feels that, right? And then it's no longer about them. It's no longer about their drives. Um, so it is that balance that I think is a really um, high level skill in teaching. This is really good. So now, was there a time for you as a teacher or leader? Because this is where the, the crossovers really come for you as mm -hmm. a teacher. Uh, there's crossovers in all that you've shared. But as a mm -hmm. teacher, or as a leader, where it was you were emotionally attached to the outcome of every student initially. Um, and, and when they, they didn't perform, you judged yourself or by the time you got into teaching, had you seen enough of that where that you knew that, Hey, listen, it is up to that human being. I can only do my best. Um, talk yeah. about that. And, and if it hasn't gone away, is it still there for you at times and you got to yeah. pull your away? So it's that, emotional attachment to the outcome or mm -hmm. the process, the age old issue. Talk about that if you would. Yeah. Okay. So I, I take it as, so it is still very much, it's, it's not something that I've walked away from. And I think it's deeply ingrained that like students are a reflection of their teacher. Right. I always think that the players are always the reflection of the coach. Uh, mm. Students are a reflection of the teacher. Like that is something that we take deep ownership over, but mm. that doesn't mean that the outcome is a reflection of the teacher. Right. So when we think of like the outcome, that's that idea of like we're thinking, OK, you did this one performance exactly as you needed to on stage or you did exactly how I, I coached you to do something at the time. Right. So that's, again, focused on that outcome. If your outcome that you're looking at is the way that they're approaching their learning, the way that they're approaching their growth. Right. There is something in music lessons that I think um that I know transfers over most, which is like when we are training someone to perform and to build these skills, there is a belief I find from outsiders um, that, you know, you're focusing on that skill set, you're focusing on that element of technique, being able to play that piece, being able to do that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, what we're focusing on is the character trait behind it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you focus on building up the character trait and the natural byproduct that you're going to see in their piano playing, but then also everything else that they do is actually it's a byproduct. 
right? And that's a byproduct that's wonderful. And I feel very fortunate because I was very much raised in this in this mindset, right? So we would be having these really focused lessons on piano and and the focus and the attention to doing our very best and you know all these different things. But then we'd go outside and we also had to do lots of yard work and housework and chores. Like that's just kind of the household that we were raised in. And it's like, if we were pulling weeds in the backyard, it's like, is this your best work? Are you still thinking about the best possible representation? Are you proud of this corner of the yard that I got you to pull weeds from? Uh, no, I think I could do better at this, right? Like it's, it's kind of like, so everything comes from a place of developing that character. So when you come at it that way, you being a reflection of your students is not about being hung up on what they did on stage. Your reflection is that, that outcome, that goal that you're working towards is the process itself, right? Wow. Really, mm -hmm. really, really good. So as you've evolved in 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 growing your business, um, you know, moving from someone who was a student and someone who was acknowledged highly productive, um, and then performing, and then moving to teaching and leading other people. What were the the greatest challenges for you in transitioning from? Because there's there's some. Um, you're a pro athlete in what you do. You're a professional musician. There are many pro athletes, and, and maybe it's the same thing in your industry too, that just cannot teach or coach mm -hmm. because of, of their expectation, of their, of their um, I, I guess, in a lot of places, maybe it's judgment. Um, mm. What would you say to other leaders that was the biggest growth part of those? Just what you're talking about, really focusing on the character, and not expecting them to be at your level. Uh, because I think I see a lot of people, the one thing I'll say to leaders is, you know, stop expecting them to be you, they're never going to be you. And is that wrong? Is that a wrong way to, 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 to have them approach that? How did you do it? And what is the right way for someone to transition from being a performer, you're a great salesperson, performer, great musician, to now you lead other people? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a great question from a teaching standpoint as well. I think I like to go back to even, even before that, where ultimately when you are a strong performer, first of all, I actually think of myself, I think when I think about what I was pursuing in my career, even though I was able to achieve a great deal in performance, I actually think I, I was always thinking of myself first and foremost as a teacher. I feel like that's where, you know, I was performing on top of what I was doing with teaching, but that performing was always, always there. Um, but one of the greatest ways that you can learn about your skills as a performer, or as an athlete is, is through teaching, right? That's the highest level of education. So when you think about like, I, oh, I need to switch to be that teacher. If you come at it from a place of like, just looking at your own skills and your own abilities from a point of objectivity. And we'll do this with our students in classes and we do this in you know different industries. We'll say like, switch and turn on your teacher mind. What would you think from an objective standpoint? And it allows you to kind of stand back that yes, it's not, I will agree with you that it's not about making that person into you. It's about giving those parts of you to that person and showing those parts of you to that person so that they can understand and see what's possible. And then the beauty of teaching is you have no idea what the result is going to be. You have no idea what beautiful thing is going to come out of that, that you, we all look at every skill, every experience through our own unique lens, right? So if I show them and I teach them how to go through a certain process of getting up on stage and doing this, you know, thing and having this accomplishment, what they're going to get on the other side of that is completely different than something that I would. And that's the beauty of it, right? And we see it really clearly in things like music lessons, where we'll have these students that grow up and they, we grow up and they grow up in a class, right? So you get to know everyone's kind of on similar paths of, of development. And then some of them grow up and some of them are writing, like I look at some stu students that I grew up with, right? Some of them are writing about the arts and they're, you know, accomplished journalists. Some of them uh, perform, but then they're also surgeons, right? Some of them have done, and all of this comes through this lens of whatever that process was for you, then let go and allow it to be what it is. Because you personally, you have, you we can't imagine how great and how beautiful that can be, right? So again, like just stepping back and saying, and whatever happens with it, I gave you what I have, right? And you take it in and let it evolve in your own space. Right. Really good. So then there's this transition from um, being a, a student and then being a teacher. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, too, was, okay, great. I can transfer. I mean, because there's a constant transference of skill set. You experienced it. And then I think there's this, just like as you mentioned earlier, was always evolving, 
but that that evolution is just transferring down transferring down transferring down then you went to talk to us about that step going from leading students to now leading leaders mm -hmm. <laughs> that again felt like a natural evolution like i'm someone who really values just adapting my thinking challenging my own thinking right mm -hmm. like i know that i i have a deep need to always feel challenged right so not challenged in a way we're kind of getting off on different paths and doing different things but it's kind of like what's another layer of this development because I know I'm not done growing. I know I'm not done exploring the things that I need to explore. So I think it came from a place of really understanding also that that ability of teaching and understanding teaching from an objective point of view and understanding kind of specific techniques that you can apply to teaching. And it's not about it's not about you. It's about, hey, there's strategies, there's tools, just like in any field, there's tactical strategies that you use and you implement. And then seeing how much value that comes from people knowing these and seeing how well it transfers into different fields. I think it just became a natural kind of extension of, mm. of the teaching process, right? And the, and the exploration process and that kind of enjoyment of helping people see what's possible in any way that I can. Really good. Um, so taking a look at, at teachers and, and no judgment to it, but as you've had people work work for you and work with you, what would you say to someone who's a coach, a teacher? Um, what do you see as as some of the um, internal obstructions that that people have and typically don't break through um, to move to that highest level? And you know, maybe you know, just performing was 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 great for you, uh, but leading other people, coaching other people. What have you seen? Uh, have you seen some attributes of others? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that that work better than maybe those that don't make it in the the teaching space because mm -hmm. here's how you've evolved to this business you're you're trusting um you know the many many years that you have of doing this uh, a reputation a standard of excellence mm -hmm. uh, a desire to pass that down and now you're letting go and that's one of the tough things with leaders um mm -hmm. talk about those that uh, th there's that letting go which you said is pretty pretty natural but how about mm -hmm. the that have made it and those are excuse me the coaches and teachers that make mm -hmm. it those that that really don't and so from a teaching standpoint specifically which ones let them uh, really break through to to being a high level teacher yes uh, yes okay so i think that when you st switch to teaching what i found is there can be first of all a pressure that you need to know everything right, right. And I think that, and that's it. Like people, it's like, it's, it's so interesting. And you see it actually, when you do that exercise, if you're working with students, you'll say, put on your teacher hat. And then right away, they'll go, well, I don't know how to teach. And they'll go, well, put on your teacher hat. Like, what do you like think objectively? Like if you were watching this from the outside and they said, well, I don't know what to say. I don't have that. I don't have a certificate. I haven't taught before. I haven't all, all of this. Right. <laughs> so I think to think of it, and that's, I think going back to where and you think of your own personal development, right? And your own growth process. Yeah. It doesn't now all of a sudden move to someone else's growth process. Continue to think of it as an element in your growth process. But the difference is, is especially when you're working with adults and you're working with them at different points in their, in their involvement, is that it's very much something where you're walking alongside each other. It really is. You're guiding them. And so when you look at it in that way, it allows you to come from a place of curiosity, of um, not having kind of ownership again over that outcome that now I'm responsible to have all the answers. You are further along in the path and the people that you're leading. But as soon as you turn off and say, well, now I'm, now I'm the teacher, I have the teacher hat on and I have nothing else to learn. I'm just here to guide all of you. That's when you see that things start to kind of devolve into something that is going to be really limited in where it can take both parties, both halves, right? So I think that's that's the big piece. And we see it actually a lot in classical music, I'll say. So I, I know that you're probably hearing this through the lens of, I imagine you see that with coaches and, and mentors, right? That now you're the teacher, but you see it in a big way in the arts because there's kind of this expectation that you're done lessons and now you kind of have it all and you self-study and you're wise. I'm, I'm, I'm not to generalize, this is not the way it is, but it's very common, right? <laughs> And yeah. as soon as you do that, you do what would happen. What happens is what would happen to any student is you you limit your growth. You put a ceiling on what you can see. You um, get very anchored in your own biases, and you like sit in your confirmation bias. It becomes more about proving that the way you do things is best, and less about you know, hey, let's try that. Hey, that's a great idea, competitor. Hey, I like that you're doing that. I respect that you're doing things differently. 
what can I learn from that, right? And I think across the board, when you see um, any limits that we build in, it's because we think that, you know, the, there's nothing left for us to learn. And ultimately, we're all still learning from everyone around us, or should be, at least. Well, there's a couple of things that come up there. It's, it's, I mean, there's no accidents. You know this. I, I received a, um, a text message this morning from a gentleman, uh, runs a team, and he says, you know, you're backed against the corner. 10 years, what would you sell, tell yourself or do different um, uh, 10 years, 10 years ago? You know what I said? Mm -hmm. Not tried to prove myself every mm. single day. Yeah. And, and, and this is beautiful though, too, because you take a look at, I love what, what Carmen's sharing here for those of you watching and, and, um, or listening, we both subscribe to that. I'm in a mastermind with Dean Graziosi and, and and Carmen and I have been friends for six years or so, I think now. Seven, uh, seven, 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 seven years, seven years. And so we've constantly got the curiosity and you just, um, to talk to that, I'm in that mastermind and because I'm always climbing and climbing and climbing. And I just go, Carmen, you have to, mm -hmm. and boom, she jumped right in. And so we'll be with each other in a mastermind. I think it's, it's, it's easy to say lifelong learner. I think there's a lot of these buzzwords out there, but I just hope that everyone heard just from a, from a true essence is that we never, we never um, arrive, but she said something else too, is curiosity, staying in curiosity and riding alongside someone. I mean, I think hopefully for a lot of people out there, that, that is a freedom multiplier for you right there. Mm. Really, really good. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you've got this, this bricks and mortar business mm -hmm. and, um, Talk about the evolution, because again, this is all very, very, it's all parallel where we're, we are, there's, there's a problem or a desire. And, and so we gain the skill sets. We talk about it a lot. We educate about it a lot. Um, and, and we share enough with other people and we sell a house. We recruit an agent. We, we open a business. We, we, we bring in more students. It's all parallel. Mm -hmm. So people to capture that as we're sitting here talking about sure it's 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 a music business talk about the evolution into the online world mm -hmm. and, and what were your discoveries and what do you continue to discover and just from the general in, in taking this bricks and mortar moving it to the online world mm -hmm. I, I just want to first speak to the parallels like obviously the parallels that is performance-based work right like it's not a, it's not that knowledge education mm -hmm. business it's very much performance-based education that it's like can you do it can you execute can you demonstrate the skills right so there's that parallel but I know that we uh, Justin and I would uh, always joke about the parallels between our business because at one point, you know, like I've got 40 teachers and at one point he had 40 agents and then I had a thousand students and he was doing a thousand deals, right? And we're kind of like, oh, it's the same. But I mean, ultimately it's an arts business, which I think um, can lead, lead to an element of kind of, you know, the arts can be a little bit mis mysterious sometimes to, to different fields, but ultimately it's a service-based business, right? It's a traditional brick and mortar business where we are offering um, a unique set of services to a um, very valued kind of clientele. We rely on building long-term relationships with them. So our typical student will stay with us for eight years, right? Eight to 10 years is kind of like the average there, right? So we're very much in the relationship business, which I know transfers over um, so much as well, very much in thinking about long-term value as opposed to short-term gains. All of that is very much aligned, right? But it's interesting because as you said that, you know, what's the evolution? Thinking to the early stages of the brick and mortar and that was my exercise in learning to let go, because I remember when I started um, and it wasn't so much like letting go of like the the teaching, because I I was, you know, very cognizant of making sure to do that, but letting go of like building out systems, um, getting things streamlined, all of that, that took me way longer than I would yeah. like to admit, right? <laughs> like it's only in the past years so where I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be operating as the owner, not not the <laughs> doer of everything, right? So things like that. And so we all... We all have these blind spots that get opened, that our eyes get opened to through those experiences, right? So I think that was um, that was the the um, learning there. And then moving into the online space, you know, we actually started kind of branching out a little bit back in 2018 when you first mentioned it to me. But it was a way in just kind of like Zoom Zoom lessons, and we were doing like online virtual. We had a couple teachers who relocated and they kept their classes. And I remember kind of struggling to get people to recognize that this was a valid way to learn and and you know and then of course when the pandemic happened things really shifted and that was the time to launch into 
kind of the course world, right? So I did a lot of just like quick learning, um, built my email list, all of those things, learned how to do sales presentations and automations and, and just email marketing, all that great stuff, copywriting. I absolutely love it. I just love the whole space. Yes. Um, but so when I started, when I started, I came from a place of like, hey, I'm learning from these course kind of models and and creators and info infopreneurs and all those things that they're that they're called and I think the first kind of year or two I, I came at it from that way and then it was kind of after the second year when I realized hey this is very valid as as far as an, a way to learn an educational method right so my kind of educator and kind of formal teacher hat came on came back on that hat came back on less just about, Hey, look at the business of this, look at the, this scalable revenue. It's so exciting, you know, cause I've always been kind of time exchange for revenue in, in our business. So after I kind of got over that, I realized like the results that our students were getting were quite good. We had students that were passing exams. They were getting great marks. They were um, wanting kind of that same relationship that we offer in our brick and mortar school. And so that's when I kind of switched and I switched um, still, I still, of course, offering courses, but doing so in a way where I'm trying as much as possible to replicate and model after what I know is sound and healthy business practices in my education business, right? So what I look at it as is instead of like my traditional business over here and my online business, I really frame it as like more of like a, a big entity where at the base of that is, you know, all the online audience and of course the scalable revenue and all the benefits of that, that you get this big pool of people that you're able to help ultimately and guide. And then as they work up, they might start working with myself or some of the teachers at the school. That's the next level that's already happened and then move into consulting with me. So it's kind of like bringing it all together and saying like, no, it's not kind of like a side hustle or <laughs> a little add-on it's really part of this whole education business right and looking at it as one big thing that um, can support everything else in it well the one thing i want to point out because i know um that you can hear this a couple ways as someone watching or listening to this is okay great squirrel okay great squirrel mm -hmm. no what what i watched carmen do was carmen got something established sustainable certainly showing that it would could continue to evolve it was very very healthy then and, and i'm sure the discoveries came long before that but she she took care of the core business first and then right. there's the next evolution so many people i say oh we've got some success let's go do that let's go do that and that's the reason people mm -hmm. don't go. they think it's a strategy and a tactic and it's a, it's it's not a strategy or tactic getting in the way it is how does the core fundamental business look, your core business look? So I just want everyone yeah. to hear that and take care of that. Mm -hmm. let, let, I, let's, oh, go ahead. No, yeah. and I'll add to that. Like that is that is a big learning that I've had also in all that I do. It's like, cause I, I um, very deep, I track my time very in a very detailed way, right? Mm -hmm. And I've made sure that like the brick and mortar business, I have an amazing team who who runs the school now, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I spend between three to five hours a week kind of like answering, but it's like usually different times of the year, like three hours a week, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I know that that's taken care of. I check in and then that allowed me to do, move into the online uh, piano business, which I've also have a great team that I'm building out there, right? So being responsible about stepping out, because that is definitely something to be aware of. I think it's important to keep doing those iterations, but there's a difference between iterations where you're evolving and adding layers to what you're doing versus just going in multiple directions, right? And so that distinction that you point out, that's very important because I agree. People can say like, and, and I'll add a fifth business and I'll add a sixth. It's like, no, this is all... <laughs> Part of the same thing, the same process. It's just these are the layers that I'm adding, and only after that foundation is built at one step. And in that way, you can really continue to build out. Like when I think about my businesses at all their different stages, you always think about like when is it a baby business? When it is is it a child business, a teenager business? And now it's like an adult business. I'm right? a grown up now. Yeah, now it's a grown up. Now you need to get out of the house and you can handle this on your own, right? So it's like when I look at my brick and mortar business, I it's you know, it's 10 years old. So I spent a lot of time building things up, building out systems, have an amazing team. So that's my adult business. Like I I'm still there whenever it calls me, right? If it really needs anything, but basically it's independent. I've given it everything it needs and mm -hmm. it's good, right? And doing that now, I would say my online piano business is probably like in the teen stage and mm -hmm. then now it's like so I can back off from that a little bit sure. I have more on automation and letting that kind of do its thing and that allows me to move to this next step of 
consulting and working with more business leaders, right? So it's all, it's, it's still meant to be um, layered and focused. Okay. I love it. That was, that was really good. Hey, Lexi, what do you need? Okay, yeah. that's about how it goes. Yeah, right? you're good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So let's let, let's spend um, the last part of our time uh, in 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 this next iteration that that I've watched, and it's interesting too because, gosh, was it has it been three years? Um, and, I mean, and and it wasn't that you just went down this path. I mean, this is this talks to what we're talking about is this growth part. Was it three years ago you zoomed in to all these team leaders or was it longer than that? You zoomed in and talked to them about high performance and practice or was it four oh. years ago when you first did that? Four years? I think it was four years. It was at the four start years of ago. the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then and, and you've done and then other team leaders would ask you to to zoom in too. I know that yeah. that's at the outside of Justin's team. Um mm -hmm. and and then speaking on stage in high performance. Let's go into to this space because and if I mean, this is when I when I think about you um, and, and and what you are all about. Certainly, you're there to serve. You're there to teach. You're there to transfer skill sets. You're there to have people experience their highest version of self that they want to get to. But I think about this: it's high performance is when I think about you. And and high performance for everyone. If you're listening to this, doesn't mean oh, okay. Well, I'm not elite. Listen, elite is being better than you were and continuing to be. That's my opinion. So. Mm -hmm. Talk about the high performance business, um, which which has been just so, especially your last presentation there in in, in December, at, at the Maverick, um, and and what are you seeing right now as you've been inside real estate organizations, mm -hmm. and uh, from a consultant standpoint, not a judgmental, but just observations. Where where would you say that? Oh man, here's where my ahas of where team leaders or broker owner managers are just missing some elements in the teaching and training that you've observed in our industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to just, I just want to speak to it really quickly, John, is that, you know, when I think about that four years ago, when you invited me to start speaking to, to people in the industry and other business leaders, I really, you were the catalyst for me opening up to different industries. So that truly is. And again, that speaks to like your ability as a mentor and teacher to say like, Hey, you've got blind spots. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So I just, I want to acknowledge how much I appreciate that just ongoing. Um, and then, yes, I think as I did that, you realize, so when you're in performance-based training, which is like something like classical piano, and it's so detail-oriented, and when you think high performance, you think, yes, it's not about being better than any other person or reaching some threshold and say, okay, now I'm past the point, now I'm high performance. It is about learning how to draw out the maximum representation of what you're capable of, recognizing that that will change and evolve over time, but building in the ability to draw yourself forward actively, right? And in a, in a, a tactical way, like in, there's, a, there's a really clear way to do that. So I think when we are in performance-based work, if you're in, you know, if you're an athlete, if you're a classical musician, classical dancer, we're doing that in such a focused way throughout our entire upbringing that it's all about taking like nothing, like a lump of clay and shaping it into being the highest quality representation of what you can do at that time at all times right so it's very much focused in that way and then realizing then how much of that transfers over to everything in the way that you can approach your business um, your health your fitness uh, the way that you communicate so I think that was the first thing that opened my eyes to that is that this framework that I've just lived and breathed my entire life where I just look at everything this way. I look at every project that I have, every new challenge that I put in front of me. I put it, I look at it the same way I would look at a big, at a concerto or a big sonata. I, I chunk it up, I break it down. I focus on the, like there's strategy there that you're really used to. So realizing that that's something that not everybody has, I think was the eye opener because it's like, you want everyone to have this because people look at, I know we've talked about this and we talked about it at Maverick, but it's like people look at talent and it just becomes such a disconnect. It's so shrouded in mystery. It creates such a disconnect but be, to the actual process that took place to get people there, right? And when people don't realize that there's a clear process in place, that we don't just wake up and we're a 10-year-old playing with an orchestra, it's like, no, there were meticulous layers of very specific things that were happening um, that were in place. When you see that objectively, then you realize that you're empowered to do those same things as well. You're not left with kind of whatever you have at the time, or you're just going to keep doing your best. There's specific things that you can do. So that's that's the the 
thing that um, inspired me most to start sharing that outside of my field, because frankly, most people in my field, not, not, I mean, many people in my field know this, right? And so being able to share this and share these insights that, you know, this is how you become talented. So then when you actually learn these things and you look at the ways a lot of, especially real estate teams, uh, organizations are doing their training, and I don't know, I'm so curious because I know we've talked since Maverick, but like when you see it and you have it presented in such a clear way, did it become glaringly obvious the things that are not happening in most training to you? I'm curious. Like 100%. Yes, yeah. right. Right. Like it's such a performance based field mm -hmm. and most of the training is not approaching it in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Most of the training is knowledge based. It made uh, me better. I mean, we've been friends for for, like I said, seven years and hung around and, mm -hmm. and just hearing going, oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm getting up here in front of thousands of people. I'm very grateful for it and, and, and respect it at a level as a teacher. And I'm like, holy moly, I'm in elementary school. I mean, it's powerful I, stuff. Yeah. And I don't think that's true. You know, like, I don't think that's true in that. As, and th thank you for that, for that. But I think like when I see the way that you coach people, I think you are actually very action focused, action based, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So there is that element of like, you need that feedback loop and you need to, you need to follow through with what's mm. on the other side. Right. Mm. Um. So the, the first thing that I notice in real estate organizations and most trainings is that they're very much, they're like an info course based right? It's like, here's the information you have. Now you have been gifted this information. Now be amazing, right? And it's like, it's not going to happen. And we yeah, pray. it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that also like, there's that balance too. Mm -hmm. And you see this just, I think in all kind of coaching teaching spaces is that it can be very impactful to bring an inspiring message, but that can be one of the riskiest things because when we feel inspired, like when we walk away mm -hmm. from reading a book or kind of learning something new and we have this aha moment, right? That actually gives us kind of a little dopamine hit and it kind of scratches an itch and it's like, hey, we've moved forward. Oh, I know something new. And that can actually have the opposite effect because it's like, well, you still haven't implemented anything new, but you feel like you have, right? So and good. And so that's where it's like you, you we want to have that balance of like we're being inspirational, but you have to make sure that practical is there where it's like you feel great, good, but don't feel too great because you haven't actually done anything yet. Right. Yeah. It's like that it's like it has to be that balance. That but balance I'm gonna go to another seminar and feel really, really yeah. good about it and do Man, something I'm, next time. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting good at this. And it's like, well, no, you're not, but you're getting you're good, good at, at speaking not the missing seat. any events. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you've got lots of ticket stubs to lots of events, but what have you done lately? Right. So there's that piece. So then when you come back to the other side of it, that's kind of like that. I know we talked about like mastering the mundane. Right? right. So it's like, yeah, you've got the glamour of the inspiration and the things that you know are possible. And that has to be there. Don't get me wrong. Like you have to, we have to be going towards these targets. We need to have people opening our eyes to what's possible, to making us think bigger, all of that. We need that there. But there's this whole other side, which is that mastering the mundane, which is like the nitty gritty, the, the less glamorous, like the structure of what needs to be in place. Even mm -hmm. basic things like if you look at the most, of, I think all of the organizations that I've, um, had the opportunity to gain insights to so far, the majority is going to be that knowledge-based learning. There's not a lot that's actually built in to draw out skills. It's kind of a lot about preparing for skills, but you're, there's not, this small fraction of it is actually uh, focused on drawing things out, actively drawing things out, putting people on the spot to shape these skills actively. And that's another thing that I think is important for people to realize is that these skills don't, come through this aha moment i mean they come little bits at a time because you're you're building them out you're drawing them out there's active things that you have to say like hey you can do that what could you do better there let's try it again hey you can do that i'm going to throw some challenge at you try it again it's like there is this active process where you're constantly trying to um draw that out and most of what i see is that it's not it's not that it's a lot of it's a lot of discussion right you nailed it. Um, so, so let's do this and um, we're going to have to get together again here soon. Uh, well, pretty soon because you've got something that uh, you're working on. So we'll yeah. do a little bit of a, we'll do a little bit of a teaser here. Okay. Um, just give us an overview of not only working on, you're working in it now. You worked mm -hmm. on it. You've, you've taken all of, of, of these many years of experience and learning and, and, and applying and now you have brought it to the real estate industry under the radar um mm -hmm. 
talk to us as a general what you have brought forward and what you're bringing forward and what the vision is is for that project that you've got going right now. Yes. So that project is Agent Agent Development, Agent Development Inc., agent, agentdevelopment.com. And that comes from this same standpoint of that it's not about learning this information that you need. Of course, there's a lot of information that does need to, to be learned, but you'd be surprised how much of things uh, about growth have to do with unlearning the things that you need to ignore and not focus on and instead focus on an active development of skills, of character traits, of mindset, of behavior, of values, and that can all be done through active exercises and training. And so ultimately that's where the the term of development came over, you know, something knowledge-based, um, something that can be there to actually draw out, draw out what your potential is, right? So we've been um, testing a lot of these things in the Justin Haber real estate team, right? And exploring, and it's very, it's very much focused on data, um, getting those measurable outcomes um, that we can rely on and that we can continue to iterate. And it's really something that we're, we're launching in with, with the plans of it being something that we continue to grow and evolve through exactly how we talked about teaching, right? So we're going to be walking alongside and doing all these iterations and layering on so that we can really walk alongside people as they're building their skills and growing their organizations and becoming profitable and healthy and, and dynamic and a representation of their, of their highest self, right? Of their high performance. That's a perfect teaser because <laughs> everyone's going to be, wait a minute, I want more. <laughs> And we'll have more on that. Let's um, do this. What would you, what would you say to someone? Um, because listen, you're you, you've done amazing things, and here's what I know: is everyone that's done amazing things has has gone through challenging times. Uh, mm -hmm. And and right now we're in an industry that it, it is a challenging time for people. What's what's one thing you would say to someone who is is um, because when we're in challenging times, you know, that's in self doubt. Maybe their confidence is down. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe they're questioning whether this industry is for them. What would be one thing you would say to whether an agent, a team leader, a broker owner, anyone in our industry and in, in, that might be in that spot as they mm -hmm. navigate here March 8th of 2024? Mm -hmm. place. Yeah, I think it would be that anything that we can be, any character trait, anything about ourselves, we can only become through testing. It can only become and it can only take shape by it being tested. So it's easy for me to say that I'm a confident person and that I have strong business acumen when all of my businesses are perfectly healthy. That's that's great. But what about when things go sideways? What about when things are not the way that I want them to be? That's actually when you are being called to decide what that character trait is, right? So look at it as you're being tested, whether it be your confidence, your belief in yourself, your innovation, your problem solving, whatever it is, look at it from the mindset of curiosity of saying, what am I being tested to draw out and take it, take it in that way and look forward to what's on the other side of that. Cause it's always, when you push through the best way out is always through, right? Always, always. Carmen, I appreciate you. You're awesome. Look forward to doing it again. And I can't wait till uh, we take that little teaser out there to, uh, to everyone in the industry. Cause I know it's really going to impact them. So Thank, thank you so you, John. much. Always. Thank you. Thanks for having me.